Hassan Kakula versus the National Director of Public Prosecutions and for others? May it please the court, Milady, I appear once again with my learned friends, Mr. Kerr Phillips and Ms. Amwepe. <coughs> Mr. Akonzo and I, Ms. Philip Key, on behalf of the respondent. Thank you very much. Yes, I've had an opportunity to read the opposing affidavit. I don't see a replying affidavit. No replying affidavit, my lady, in all the circumstances. Yes. So nothing that needed a reply. Thank you. You may proceed. As your lady, please. My lady, at the outset, might I hand up a, a set of submissions? Lady, in this application, one sees that we, we focus for present purposes on the two primary um, aspects of relief that we seek, and that is pending the outcome of the main application. Your Ladyship by now is aware the main application was served on the Friday morning at 6.30, um, but it didn't, it didn't have the desired result that we would just await a court hearing the matter. And then, as we've dealt with in the papers, by the next day, 10 o'clock, we launched the urgent application, which is before your ladyship. Um, so what was your purpose of that application? That application, my lady, if your ladyship turns to... Yes, I know, but you say it doesn't have, it didn't have the desired result. So what so we... That, I know what the application, main application is seeking. What desired result Well, you we sought in that application a, an interdict, an interim interdict, of an arrest, pending what we say in that affidavit. We expected that that would have the desired result, as I put it, of the, of the, the NPA and others um, waiting, not attempting to arrest our client. There was the possibility, of course, that by this coming Wednesday, the 3rd of April, the parties may have been able to resolve things and we would have gone down to Litt Littleton Saps and our client could have been processed and we could have avoided everything. But they wouldn't even give us an undertaking, they would not give us no undertaking whatsoever. And so, so what when I say the desired that? result, one ex would have expected that they would say, okay, we'll, we'll all just hold this in abeyance, we're not going to arrest your client. And that was the purpose of, as you read in these papers on Friday, through the course of Friday morning, my attorney constantly trying to get hold of uh, the, the NDPP. And the purpose was to say, what is your attitude? Not whether you're going to oppose or not. They had until Tuesday to do that, tomorrow. But what is your attitude towards our client's position? So what we did not do, my lady, is we didn't bring an urgent application on Friday morning, trying to be in court on Saturday morning, or even by the following Tuesday, we expected, reasonably speaking, on the facts, and I'll get to those facts in a moment, my lady, we expected that, uh, uh, that rational thinking, a rational decision in and around arrest, as I'm going to take your ladyship to now, would have resulted in them saying, well, we're not going to arrest your client, or just making it clear to us. Well, that didn't help. When we then threatened to bring, we, my attorney had prepared a draft affidavit that morning as he was sitting following all the news, etc. And when he notified, obviously in terms of the practice uh, directive um, in, in, in the Gauteng Courts, my lady, when he, when he advised the, D, the NDPP that uh, he was going to bring an application of being caught at 3 o'clock, then we got the response, don't worry, we're not going to arrest your client today. We then sought, well, what does today mean? <laughs> you say not today, what about, what about tomorrow, Sunday, Monday? No answer, no response. And eventually in the media, we heard the media had been in contact with the, the, the NPA. And he had said to them, they had said, well, what do you mean if you're not going to arrest her today? He said, I said, we're not arresting her today. No more, no less, as you read in our, our founding affidavit. Well, the no more and the no less, my lady, meant that, well, we're not doing it today, but we could do it tomorrow. We could do it the next day. So we had hoped in launching that first application that we would have a party just back off, 
and we'll deal with the matter either amicably, amicably, because we that first affidavit, that first application, the main application was served on Friday morning just past. My attorney is available on the 3rd of April, my lady, which is next Tuesday, not this, not tomorrow, next Tuesday. The parties may well have resolved the matter, but all that was required in so the meantime. So how would the matter have been resolved? Well, my lady, as you would have read in the founding affidavit in the main application, which is annexed as if um, as the first uh, annexure to the founding affidavit in this application. My attorney who got involved in the matter on the, on, the wind, on the Sunday morning, the 17th, that afternoon already he had been in contact with both the investigating officer as well as the NDPP. And he had made clear to them that he was stuck in a trial in Durban and he, his first available date would be the 3rd of April, two weeks away. And he had motivated to them to say, look, if, you know, you say you've had, they informed him, they'd been investigated for six months. These are five-year-old plus allegations. Just to wait another two weeks for his availability and he would meet them at Littleton Police Station with his client. To do what? Whatever the police wanted to do. So they wanted they to meet. Well, well, no, milady, that would not be an arrest. They'd process her, give her the opportunity of being warned. And then they, they had indicated they'd like to take her down to court. They're not going to oppose bail. The matter be postponed. The, the arraign her. The matter gets postponed for the next uh, two months odd to the High Court. So he made that clear then in his letter. And if your ladyship makes a note or turns with me. The solving of this problem of being, she now goes to the police station. You say she's not arrested, I don't know then what happens, but then she then goes to a magistrate and, and, and there's bail set. Is that what you say? That, that, is what, that is what the investigating officer, Mr. Perimel. No, but I'm asking you, is that what you say the resolution of this matter would have been? That's, yes. Well, milady, they wanted my attorney and his client. The initial discussions were to meet with them. We assume that's what meeting with it, and there were these undertakings or the, the discussion along, was along the lines of meeting at Littleton Police Station to process her however they need to process her. She doesn't have to make a warning statement, um, but they would have offered that. My attorney would have been there. She would have been arraigned all the time under the watchful eye of my attorney so that she's not conscripted into giving some sort of evidence against herself. Now, that would have happened, as I say, on the 3rd of April. When we launched this application, to come back to your ladyship's question, when we launched the main application, we had hoped that by the time common sense prevailed, the parties would have resolved this. But we certainly did not expect that the NBA would persist in trying to arrest our client while that application was extant. Where have they persisted in arresting us? Well, zero two seven six. And he talks about the conversations that took place the day before. Paragraph three, my lady. Should I wait for your ladyship there? Please, please. Thank you. Zero zero two dash seven six. Paragraph 3, our telephone discussions have revolved chiefly around the level of disclosure you are prepared to make as to the allegations against my client and my availability to meet with you, with my client, to facilitate her being processed at the Littleton Police Station and then be taken to the Pretoria Central Magistrates Court prior to the matter being transferred to the Pretoria High Court to be in, indicted in a month or two. Paragraph 4, sets out his client's instructions and her intent of cooperating fully. That's what he's already done. He's, he's said, I, two weeks' time, I'm available, my client is cooperating with you. Then it says in paragraph 6, the purpose of this letter is threefold. 
one over the page six in, at paragraph 6.1 to indicate my unavailability up to 3 April 2024. I am in a long trial in the Durban High Court until 28 March 2024 as well as a leave to appeal application in the same court. 3 April is the date I propose for meeting you with my client. The second purpose is to bring facts and information to your attention which are material to prospective decisions by the South African Police Services and National Prosecuting Authority. Inter alia, whether or not to arrest my client and whether or not to enroll the matter at court. So, my lady, if I can just stop at that juncture, it is not, arrest is not the mechanism that you use to get someone to court like the applicant. And these were the nature of submissions being made to them that in making your decision on whether or not to arrest our client, you need to hear us, just hear us on these things. Milady, might I at this juncture just advise, I will be arguing uh, the, the urgency and the interdict of the matters. My learned friend, Mr. Kerr Phillips, Milady, he will argue, he will deal with arrest in particular, standing orders, and to the extent necessary, judicial peak. So that is how we will, we will um, deal with the argument, Milady. And then lastly, the third aspect, to seek disclosure to put the several concerns raised below to rest, together with the requisite authority that would indicate that disclosure of adequate particularity is a right which pre-exists charging indictment of a person at court, and is a prerequisite for adequate exercise of the right to make a warning statement to influ influence the prosecutorial decision as to enrollment. Now, my lady, that letter goes on to list a whole host of, of factors. It's no secret who our client is. It's also no secret that she's, she's in her later 60s. Um, my attorney set out a number of factual uh, statements uh, as to her identity. Um, if you go to page 79, you'll see a heading there that says the weakness of the potential charges against my client. And you may have noticed in the answering affidavit, there's a criticism to say, well, you haven't seen the docket. How could you say our case is weak? Well, on the, as far back as the 3rd of March, the respondents, and it can only be purposeful, leaked their main piece of evidence, so we would think, the 204 statement to the media, to the press, as far back as the 3rd of March. I'll give your ladyship the reference, if I may, to that, to that actual... Um, I'll just find it here, my lady, forgive me. Um, it, in fact, if you, if you make a note, my lady, at 2-55, that's um, Annexure NMN, um, is the first article that came out. And if you read that article, you will see that the, draft, the, 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 the writer of this press release, without doubt, had in his or her hand the 204 statement, quotes directly from it. So my attorney is making, ma is making an appeal that in the circumstances that, and it could only have been leaked through, the, through the, the, one of the respondents, in light of that, he's asking for certain discovery, disclosure the 204 statement. And he goes on, nonetheless, also to prevail on them to stay away from attempting to arrest our client. There's no need for it. It's not a mechanism that one needs to use in relation to our client. Now, so, expand on that thing, please. so Mr. Kerr Phillips will deal with it later, but it oh, comes okay, no, but no, it no, does no. come, but let me assist your ladyship, it comes down to this, my lady, that <laughs> if you use arrest when you don't need to arrest, you're abusing the, the, the mechanism of arrest. Now, my lady, our client, we don't say that our client is entitled to any more rights than anyone else. She has equal rights. Makes no difference. We, what we argue here, we could argue for any other citizen who otherwise was not a flight risk, uh, etc. Are you saying you can come to court for any other citizens and say, please do not arrest me? If the facts, if the facts cry out for interference from the court, yes, my lady, indeed so. 
if your ladyship If some senior counsel at the bar, for example, had been arrested and knows his rights... So it's always something of importance. So no, only important people. Well, because no, it's, we've now have a speaker and then we have a senior counsel. Well, my lady, I'm trying to bring it closer to home so we can put up... Our, it doesn't matter who it is. But if it's someone, and the facts are all similar to this, forget the identity. Well, they shouldn't have to be arrested either. But when the person is someone who so, is sorry, well known... I'm, I'm really just trying to understand. So what are the facts that negates against an arrest? In this instance, well, yes. I've got to take your ladyship through that. Yeah. So let me move on, Nuno lady. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Um, Mr. Kerr Phillips will then deal with the rest of that answer. But lady, the very next... No answer is received to this letter on Monday. The very next day... At approximately 6.30 in the morning, the respondents raid, or they arrive to execute a search and seizure warrant. A warrant they'd had for some nine days already. That's fine. You don't have to tell us all that you've, you're doing. Of course, we, we learned from them in these papers that their investigations were completed a long time ago, prior to the 7th or the 8th of March. Because, in fact, even prior to that, because they communicated the decision to prosecute to our client, they communicated to our client when she was still overseas. And that was around about the 7th or 8th. So they, they took it before then. They, 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 they changed the date in their papers, nothing turns on it. So they had made a decision to prosecute, and they'd also made a decision to leak their evidence to the public or to the press, put it into the public domain, and but they found a need to arrive at her home on Tuesday morning after the attorney they had been trying to get hold of, they wanted that's, you'll, you'll recall reading, they telephoned her while she was overseas wanting to know her attorney's details. She didn't have an attorney then, she appointed one immediately as she came, as she when she got home, and my attorney uh, was then thereafter acting for her. That afternoon, the Sunday, when he first consulted with her, he spoke with the NDPP and as well as the, uh, which I'll just refer to as the, as the, uh, the, the DPP. He spoke to him, he spoke to the investigative officer, Mr. Piramil, he writes this letter. Well, the next morning they wrote. But that they could do, but he required, him and his client required just two things. Show us the necessary information so we can ensure that the warrant is lawful, the underlying affidavit, the list of items you're looking for, and wait for someone from my office to get there. There are the conversations. The minute when, when my attorney couldn't persuade, it was actually Mr. Belichan, Sergeant Belichan. When my attorney couldn't persuade Mr. Belichan to show these documents, reveal these documents to his client and then in turn to him, he said, well, then I may have to consider an urgent application. Immediately after that telephone conversation, Sergeant Bellaton jumps into action and starts his search and seizure. Mr. Schmidt, sitting to my right, arrives some time after, but he's, a, he's, he's, he's presented a fait accompli. They say, well, he, was, he didn't just observe, he could have said things. Well, lady... One need only go to a scene where the, the South African police are in charge of that scene and they are searching. You, you don't have much opportunity to say anything. The, the horse is bolted, so to speak. Milady, there's no version on, on the, there's no proper version here, there's no proper dispute effect. It's pretty much, it's, it is common cause that they went in before my client's, my client could be represented by her attorney of choice. But there's not a prayer that this be set aside? Or, so no, it's not, this is not the forum for that. Yeah. But it is a common cause, it's a common cause factor. Milady, the, the point is that, um, might I just take a sip of water if I may? The point is, 
my attorney and my client's complaint throughout is that what this has been about from the start is notwithstanding their utterances that all they sought to do was to get her attorney on record so that they could get on with their jobs because that's what it seemed as if they were going to do the minute my attorney said well I'm available on the 3rd of April that wasn't good enough and I'll take you to the letter now they wanted her then to be there on the the Wednesday or the Friday so that's Wednesday the 19th uh, no Wednesday the 20th or else Friday the 23rd I thought 22nd now and in fact I'll take you to the letter now where they say this is not a negotiation now if she's in if she's entitled as she is as a matter of law to be represented by the attorney of her choice then those were the facts that they were confronted with they later say that he's causing delay my lady there's no case to accuse my attorney of having <coughs> caused delay right up front he committed himself to a date two weeks hence in the circumstances of being committed to a trial in Durban a well-known trial and as I said on the Tuesday there is this raiding of her home it's common cause they did so without her attorney first arriving so whether one one can see that then as the first attempt at denuding the applicant of her rights to be her right to be at all times represented by the attorney of her choice now that afternoon there was a letter wrote, written the Tuesday afternoon it did not deal with the lengthy letter of my attorney on the Monday <coughs> now that letter is found at page 97 in section 2 Milady. That's the third annexure to the main application. <coughs> Thank you, my lady. Paragraph two, this office will not respond to every averment and or question. However, that must not be construed as an acceptance of same. Well, they didn't answer to anything, and they essentially still haven't. Our office has been courteous in requesting you to ensure that your client avails herself for the process of being charged and enrolled. That's precisely what he had done, my lady. His client had tendered her cooperation. Paragraph 5, you're reminded that the courtesy that was extended to your client is not a negotiation and not open-ended. Well, then, how is it a, a courtesy? Then at paragraph 7, the said officers inform me that your client was cooperative, which she had always attended, and that she indicated her willingness to meet with the investigating officer on Wednesday, the 20th, at Littleton Police Station, to be charged and then immediately taken to court for enrollment. Well, my lady, this issue is raised on the papers and it's, it's disputed. Well, this is a confession by Mr. Magnati, the DPP, that he'd been told that she, that her arraignment or her processing had been discussed with her, not with Mr. Schmidt and not with my attorney, Mr. May. And that's the very point my attorney makes. And he says this happened repeatedly, and our client deposes to that, that she was repeatedly asked by Sergeant Bellishan, just come down with us, just come down with us, just, we'll sort it all out. Why is that, my lady? Well, one can only suspect, reasonably suspect, that they want to get her aside without her return. They don't really want Mr. May with her. What they want to do is they want to conscript her in the hope that she's going to give evidence against herself, say something. That's why her evidence, uh, her representation by an attorney of her choice is so important. So it's common cause that this happened, my lady. Paragraph 9. In the circumstances, now, let me read this and I'll make the point. In the circumstances, the matter will be enrolled on Friday the 22nd, as discussed with you on Sunday the 17th. 
It remains your prerogative to ensure that your client is represented throughout the process. Now, if you go back to seven, my lady, the said officers inform you that your client was cooperative and that she indicated her willingness to meet with the investigating officer on Wednesday. Well, my lady, this letter is written now to in the afternoon. Why doesn't paragraph nine, if she was willing, and if she had agreed, why then are they arranging it for Friday? Because they know she didn't agree. And they also know whether it's Wednesday or Friday, my attorney, Mr. May, is not available. They're just forcing her, or they, they try to strong arm our client, my attorney, into doing what they want to do in circumstances where my attorney cannot do so. Now, um, paragraph 13, kindly revert as a matter of urgency regarding who will represent your client. Milady, Mr. May is her chosen attorney. He doesn't farm it out. It's his, it's his attorney. To him, she is an important person. She is an important client. Yes, there's Mr. Schmidt in his office, but he's a junior attorney, and it's not his practice. So, to suggest that, well, they could have farmed the client, out, the client out to some other attorney or briefed counsel to go and do it, that's not how it works, and that's not what's required of them, lady. So, lady, where this leads to, then, is that my attorney then writes a further letter in response to this. Well, should I say, because it's on the papers, lady, that at page 99, there's a letter, it's dated the 18th of March, it's incorrect, my lady, it should be the 19th of March, because this is now <coughs> the next day, the Wednesday. Um, my, my, my attorney's client sets out, given he's unavailable, he briefed counsel, and that was me who prepared this letter on his instructions. And... What it asks for, my lady, after going through the events of the warrant, which your lady, or the execution of the warrant, which your lady should could have read in the papers, um, and the, the, the problems with that, and that's not, that's not for this court to set aside, that can be dealt with at trial, my lady, such as it affects the, uh, the evidence. At page 104, And if your ladyship just bears with him, I may have. At 104, we say, uh, uh, my, my lady, could I, could I bother your ladyship to go back to page 98? There's something I'd left out, and I, I've just realized that. Of that's page 98. So this is now yes. paragraph 10, page 98. Are you there, Milady? Yes. Thank you. Um, so this is the letter which came Tuesday afternoon from the NPA. This office has informed you that it seeks to make the process as seamless as possible. However, your apparent delaying, Lady, there's absolutely no substance to accuse Mr. S Mr. May of delaying at any point in time, may result in a last resort of proceeding as allowed in terms of section 40 of the Criminal Procedure Act. That's to arrest without a warrant. So, lady, regrettably at this stage, and this is now um, by Wednesday morning when the letter that I'm going to read from, page 104, is sent, lady. Mr. May has immediately contacted them. He's tendered. We're now less than two weeks away from when he's available. We're dealing with somebody here, my lady, with respect. And I'm going to show you that her, her rights are the same as everybody else's. But this is somebody who has a reputation unlike most across the population. She does have a good reputation. And I'm going to take you to authority on, this, on that particular point. So paragraph 8, my attorney... As per his instructions, I drafted, he settled and he sent off his letter here. Your urgent undertaking not to arrest my client 
And to await my availability on paragraph 8 of page 104, my lady. Your urgent undertaking not to arrest my client and to await my availability on 3 April 2024 as undertaken is of necessity in all the circumstances demanded. I am constrained in all the circumstances to respectfully demand that you do so by 9 o'clock tomorrow morning, Wednesday 20 March. So this went off um, late on Tuesday. And then a response to my detailed request for disclosure in my letter of yesterday. So, milady, there's no delay here. Mr. S Mr. May responds immediately. Now, what then happens is they don't undertake. They don't want to give us an undertaking. And today still, they will not give us an undertaking that they will not arrest our client. Even for this matter, just to stand down to accommodate this court and a court that the JP is prepared to establish specially for this case. I don't know on what basis. What is the urgency, milady, for whether it's an arrest, an arraignment, a processing? What is the urgency in this matter, milady? Uh, you want me to answer you? No, we, 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 we don't know either. We don't know either, and we asked that question. So, milady, the, there's, there, there must be some urgency, but they won't tell us what it is. But what they have done is they have leaked their evidence to the media. And they have continued to feed the media information. And the, and, and the, and the media know things that the accused herself they won't tell. I understand the misgiving, but that is relevant in what sense to what you ask? Well, it's relevant in two respects. The first, the first is insofar as we say, we ask for disclosure in all these circumstances, they have no basis on which to complain, as in other cases they could complain, that there would be prejudice to them. They're, they're, uh, they're Investigations at Common Cause are complete since before, since the beginning of March sometime. So their, their investigations are complete. My attorney writes to them. He says, in these circumstances, and your ladyship would read the letter, it's detailed in what he asks for. They can come back and say, we'll give you this, we won't give you that. Yes, you're quite right. It's the 204 statements in the media, we'll give you the 204 statement. They don't do that. They don't do that, my lady. They won't give an undertaking not to arrest her and just to allow her to cooperate with them, with my attorney, on the 3rd of April. Milady, they, they don't give us the undertaking on Wednesday morning and ultimately by Friday morning, early, the main, main urgent application is launched. And just to put that in perspective, Apart from the urgency prayer, there an interdict, an interdict was sought against them arresting the applicant. It was ordering and directing the various respondents to furnish the applicant's legal representatives with the state brief, including without limitation and listed documents. So it's an application for disclosure in all the circumstances. And then we included this order, ordering and directing the first and or second and or third, fourth, etc., to arrange a date with the applicant's attorney of record for the summonsing of the applicant to appear in the magistrate's court with jurisdiction in terms of section 54. We invite the court to grant an order so that the parties do get to do what they want to do without an arrest. And of course, Milady, this application, the main application, is brought for a hearing on the 9th of March. It's, beyond, it's, it's a week beyond the 3rd of March. Now, get back to what we, one of the things we had hoped is one, they wouldn't arrest. The 3rd would come and we'd actually resolve the whole thing and the rest would be history. We couldn't bring the application before the 3rd. I mean, that doesn't create urgency just because my attorneys agreed to do it on the 3rd. 
And then came the events of Friday morning I alluded to earlier, when uh, there's a series, as you've read, there's, a, there's, there's these, these com eventually these conversations. My attorney warns to bring an application later Friday afternoon, and then this SMS comes, which says nothing, no more, no less. And that then obviously catapulted the application into this court. And I'll make submissions on that now in relation to the uh, to the law, my lady. So, lady, might I ask your ladyship to turn to our submissions? And so we just set out, my lady. We we seek pending the outcome of the main application. Um, that your ladyship interdict. That I don't think you have to repeat that. Yes, but on an interim basis. But paragraph three, under urgency, my lady, is a significant paragraph. As we say this, although the constitutional right to freedom of movement and the right to dignity does not oblige the respondents, should they decide to arrest the applicant in terms of section 40, i.e. without a, a warrant, to consider whether there are no less invasive methods to bring the applicant before court than by arresting her and thereby encroaching on her constitutional right, the discretion on whether to arrest the applicant must be exercised in good faith, rationally, and not arbitrarily. Milady, my learned friend, Mr. Kerr Phillips, is going to address you in relation to arrest and more particularly on standing orders that the police are bound by. And Milady... Yes, it is, Milady. The standing orders. Yes, Milady. Where? They are part of my attorney's first letter, which your ladyship finds at page 76. So they're, not, they're just attached to the founding act there. It's not covered in the founding No, it's covered in the, in the letter, and we, we make the point of saying that was an urgent application we brought. We don't labour the papers by just setting out things that are law, and which fall to be argued as matters of law, my lady. So they are dealt with in the papers. So if you go to page 76 of my attorney's letter, you will see, if you, 76, if you go and look at 77, my attorney first at the bottom deals with part A, availability of chosen legal representation. And then over the page, he deals with the need and desirability for arrest. Personal details, deals with the weakness of her case. Remember, my lady, the weakness of their case lies in what they've allowed to be published in the, in the, in the news. No ability or intention to interfere with the investigation. And then she goes on, my attorney goes on for a number of pages dealing with instructions to arrest and detention of suspects and the standing orders. All of this is law, my lady. We could argue it anyway. But the point is we, we make the point that in the, in the founding affidavit that Mr. May was making clear to them that he wasn't doing these things out of some sort of naivety or opportunism, he knows what he's talking about, and he sets it out accordingly. Of course, they took no, they took no cognizance of it at all, evidently. So, milady, Mr. Mr. Kerr Phillips will address you on that, and to the extent necessary, he will distinguish these facts in this situation from the one that arises in or arose in karma. So we will get to answering that question for your ladyship. We have prepared on that. My lady, from paragraph four, what your ladyship knows, our client doesn't represent a danger to society, is committed to defending herself and standing trial. She won't abscond, she won't harm herself, she's not in danger of being harmed by others, and she's keen to disprove these allegations against her. And here's the point in paragraph five, that should a decision be taken to arrest the applicant, we submit, my lady, such decision would be irrational and arbitrarily considered and not with the good faith that is required of the respondents. And the respondents say they have not made a decision to arrest the applicant. 
However, milady, the facts say otherwise. The applicant need only show a reasonable apprehension of an action that will cause her harm. Why do we say that the facts say otherwise? You would have read in my learned friend's deponent's affidavit, answering affidavit, that they say this. They say that arrest was imminent from immediately after they took the decision to prosecute. That's, that's their words, milady. Milady, we, we go through, and I'll just read through this quickly. Mr. Willis, I'm going to go to Dr. Willis. This is an urgent court, and as you know, this is my seventh application for today, of the, the same amount. So I am going to place a restriction on the amount of time that you can speak. You've now spoken, spoken nearly 45 minutes. I'll give another half an hour. Very well. Thank so you, my lady. Your ladyship just never, you never said anything at the outset, so obviously I was under no obligation. No, no, no. But I'm, 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 I'm satisfied. I'm fair not to interrupt you as much. Uh, Thank you. But I just need, need to know that you put, then give your counsel enough. Yes, yes. I, I will, I will, I'll do that and speed it up to you, my lady. So, my lady, if we just look at the following facts. We know the respondents have leaked the 204 statement. And that's bef by the 3rd of March, the latest, because that's when we've got the first article. We, I've just told you arrest was imminent from the time they took the decision to prosecute. We know that on their own version, investigation was complete. We know they were never going Sorry, to... Is this reasons for why it's urgent? Because I see it's under the heading urgency. We put it under urgency. Yes, it is, but that's the factual mat matrix as well. But yes, the investigation was complete. They weren't going to object to bail. They've never regarded our client as a flight risk. Um, the MPA wanted the applicant to be represented. However, it did not want to agree to wait for Mr. May's availability on the 3rd of April. Makes no sense, my lady. It effectively demanded that the applicant meet uh, with it at Littleton Police Station, as I've told you, it's taken your ladyship to in the letter on Friday the 22nd. The respondents executed the search and seizure warrant when they knew Mr. May was not available. Subsequent to the execution of the search and seizure warrant, the media arrived, um, or while they were executing, really. The respondent proceeded to execute the search and seizure war warrant before Mr. Schmidt arrived. And um, after the search and seizure, they respond to our letter and they still refuse. To under, not, to, uh, not to arrest, to give us an undertaking. And, milady, they don't say anything in their papers about what they found. We've got their inventory, but they don't motivate to your ladyship that they found things that, in fact, emboldened their case. Three issues arise, milady. Is there, and this is at paragraph 7, is there any need whatsoever to arrest the applicant? Or, put differently, can an arrest be justified? <coughs> Why is the, the second issue, why is this case so urgent that Wednesday the 3rd of April could not be agreed upon? There's no version on that, milady. You will not find a version in that affidavit. And the third issue, does the applicant have reasonable cause to believe that her arrest is imminent? Or the facts being made available to her, bearing in mind that the respondent chose to involve the media? If the applicant does, especially in the face of, a re uh, of repeated refusal to give an undertaking, then her constitutional rights have become imperiled. So, milady, we go on with urgency here, and I want to try and curtail this, but paragraph 8 is important. Were she to be arrested? Any time before the hearing of this matter, my lady. And this goes to our, our truncation of time periods too. She would not be afforded substantial address. And we say that her constitutional rights are being infringed already, my lady. Paragraph 10. In President uh, Republic of South Africa versus Zuma and others heard uh, this sort of this time last year, my lady. His Lordship, uh, the Deputy Judge President of the Johannesburg High Court said, According to sum up, the notion that the only route of relief a party can invoke to contest the title of this involved a private prosecutor is to raise the question of title as a plea. And then, milady, what he does is he sets out key aspects. And what we've done is we've now just made the, the relevant changes. And I'm going to read it to you, and you will consider this after in paragraph 12, milady. Mil and after inserting our own amendments, this is what his lordship effectively says, albeit there in relation to a private prosecution. Accordingly, to sum up, the notion that the only route of relief a party can invoke to contest the lawfulness of the arrest 
in a latter delictual matter or at the discharge stage or a judgment is misconceived. You will recall our learned friends tell us, or his deponent says in the papers, well, she's got a damages claim. She's got an alternative remedy. Well, his lordship, um, deputy judge president says that's misconceived. In any event, the very arrest of the applicant is what is sought to be prevented by the relief sought in this urgent application. Premised on the contention that to appear in the criminal court per se would be to submit to an unlawful intrusion on the rights to freedom for the applicant if the arrest of the applicant is unlawful for want of proper authority. Now, in that case, my lady, you will recall that um, Mr. Zuma, uh, ex-president Zuma's case was flawed on the argument by, on behalf of President Ramaphosa, that their nolly prosecute certificate was unlawful. The only difference between that case, and, and now the same thing was said, in fact, regarding arrest. It was said, well, I'll get to it now. It's just a bit of inconvenience. It just has to go to court and then it'll be postponed. I'll, I'll read to you what um, uh, Judge Sutherland says now. But um, the only difference there is we are showing the court on the basis of a reasonable apprehension that they're acting unlawfully against our client. They're not following procedure. They're not acting in good faith. They're not complying with their own, own standing orders. And why should we have to wait for them to actually arrest us when our rights are already imperiled? Well, we show on a reasonable basis they're already, already imperiled. Your ladyship's just granting interim relief. I'll get to the, the Webster-Mitchell test in a moment. So I read on, milady. Herein lies also the key factor that demonstrates the urgency relied upon in this matter. The arrest of the applicant is imminent. Well, that's common cause here. Our learned friends' papers say that. There were other grounds of urgency relied upon initially, but one alone is sufficient. So one alone is sufficient, milady. It is axiomatic that if the aim is to avoid being arrested and to appear at court under arrest, the matter before the court is urgent. To reiterate, the nub of the applicant's case is that to submit to the arrest is a violation of her rights to freedom because the applicant's arrest is or will be unlawful. We deal with uh, um, 12. Milady, um, I just want to go one step further. I'll, I'll leave the rest for your ladyship's benefit. Over the page, paragraph 19, dealing with uh, um, harm. In the matter of Masetla, the President of the Republic of South Africa and another, this is Sachs J in the Constitutional Court. People live not by bread alone. Indeed, in the case of career functionaries, reputation and bread are often inseparable. The Constitution presupposes that public power will be exercised in a manner that is not arbitrary and not unduly disrespectful of the dignity of those adversely affected by the exercise. And Milady, there's just no explanation as to why somebody like the Speaker who would otherwise have travelled to Switzerland on parliamentary business on Friday morning, something she had to cancel, you see that, my lady. Why she is being treated in this fashion when there's no urgency to the state case. My lady, if I can turn to page 9, paragraph 24, the test, Webster Mitchell. My lady, your ladyship knows it well, but would you bear with me as I just uh, articulate it here or read how it's articulated. Um, the proper approach is to take the facts set out by the applicants together with any facts set out the uh, by the respondents which the applicants cannot dispute. The lady, if you look at these papers, you read through them, there's a lot of, a lot of repetitive material, my lady, but you will not see a proper factual dispute. Now, that doesn't matter because we're on our version. We're not on their version. It's not, this is not a motion proceeding for final relief. This is for interim relief. You take our case, you take any facts that we can't dispute. Lady, my submission is there are no facts on the NPA's papers that affect the probabilities established on our case. At this juncture, my lady, to answer uh, um, two questions your ladyship had asked earlier in Chambers when we were talking about um, the ability to interdict an arrest, and you had, you had clearly indicated you would want to be addressed on, on this case here. Well, my lady, that's exactly what happened in the Zuma case and the, pres and the president. It was the interdicting of an arrest. So the answer to that question is, and that's a full bench decision, my lady, um, is yes. That's the, the first 
And then the second is, my lady, if your ladyship will recall, it's, we say we have a right. The question is, well, what go, that's what the rest of Webster and Mitchell deals with is, well, has that right been infringed? And have you got a case around that? We, we say that's clearly the case here, my lady. And the threshold is not very high when you have a look at President RSA and Zuma. The mere prospect of being dragged into the dock under arrest when there's no need for arrest, that's, what, that's exactly what the Zuma case speaks to in that instance. So, Milady, Milady, the next heading we're just <coughs> embellishing on a threat of arrest. Um, and if I can pick up Friday, this, is, this also still goes to urgency. But like I say, Milady, the factual matrix and urgency are all together. On Friday the 22nd of March, the applicant's attorney on record, Mr. Pay, attempted to establish from various conversations with the respondent whether the respondents are inclined to arrest the applicant. A detailed description of the conversations between Mr. May and the respondent is found, and your alleged preferred, significantly during the conversations between Mr. May and You've advocate. Said, Mr. Sorry? You've already said this over uh, and over about. Yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm just. Not today, tomorrow. So I need you to. Yeah, move on. lady, just so that you know wh where this goes. And there, then that's where you get the words, yes, we actually said very clearly, not today, nothing more, nothing less. And that is where the inference being that the above mentioned message and the wording not today clearly leaves the door wide open for any day subsequent to Friday. And Milady, even today, they won't give us an undertaking. Milady, we deal with the media leaks, they shouldn't be there. We deal with uh, the apprehension of harm, Milady. I've, uh, I've already alluded to that, and the threshold is set out in paragraph 41, Milady. So, Milady, there are other issues which are disputed in the papers. There's the fact that we are certain that the state are in fact intercepting our, our uh, discussions, telephonic discussions and consultations over telephone. We put up issues, now that's disputed, but that's our version. And what they do, milady, is they don't put up a proper, a, a proper dispute of fact. One just needs to go back to Whiteman's case. Your ladyship knows that. So, milady, however, even without those, that, those facts in the factual matrix, if you strip this thing down to the bare essentials around the NPA creating urgency out of arresting our client in all the circumstances I've described to you, milady. You don't even have to have regard to all the rest of it. We say that bolsters our case. But, milady, what we do say is that it is quite apparent that our client has a reasonable apprehension of being arrested in circumstances where she should not be arrested. Her right is her right not to have her dignity and her right to freedom, or Section 22, that being her right to her vocation as Speaker of Parliament, she has the right not to have that imperiled. Is it being imperiled? Absolutely it is, my lady. And the, the threshold test for these, for these is not as high as what probably our learned friends would argue. And then, my lady, there's no other remedy in law for our client. Heard what His Lordship, Mr. Deputy Judge President Sutherland, says about their def their retort to that, which is damages. And lastly, my lady, balance of convenience clearly favours the applicant. There's just simply no there's no prejudice whatsoever to the state. They put the Section 204 statement into the into the public domain. They have led the, the media by the nose in respect of whatever they're doing. And they've chosen. But even, even if they hadn't waived rights, and one doesn't need to argue a waiver, the fact is that they can't, they're, 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 their investigation is complete. There can be no prejudice to this awaiting the, an outcome, this matter awaiting an outcome on the 9th of March, Milady. Milady, I'll hand over to Mr. Kerr Phillips. And uh, I suppose, my lady, the, the arguments which he puts up are, are technical as matters of law. Your ladyship 
would know a lot about these and uh, you, you may be inclined to ask him more questions rather than, than just simply listen to him. As your ladyship, please. Yes. As it pleases the court, my lady. My lady, there are just a number of factual issues that I need to clear up before I address my lady on, on the legal position. Now, my lady would, my learned friend has put out a date line and one of the things that I'm going to pick up from is the date line of the facts placed on record by my learned friends from the date of our affidavit. And it's going, and the submission I'm going to make is a lot of the concessions, for example, in the affidavit that was filed today are made as a result of us bringing this urgent application. Let me begin. When Milady looks at the um, answering affidavit of my learned friends at page 6, paragraph 14, it reads as follows. The fact that bail will not be opposed and that the applicant will not be kept in custody takes away the urgency, if there was any, which is denied. And arrest alone cannot create urgency. This is particularly the case where there is no apprehension of, de uh, of detention. So I pick up from uh, the point ma just made by my learned friend of the apprehension of arrest. Now we before my lady, and now things are beginning to melt down a bit, insofar as the respondents are concerned. And now look, look at what they say. You're not going to be detained. We're going to grant you bail. And they argue that that takes away the urgency. In my humble submission, no, it doesn't, because the whole arrest process becomes um, a malfunction, because as a result of the concessions they've made, they specifically say now that the arrest should be, um, where arrest is one method of bringing an accused to trial, the other method in this case would be summons. And in on behalf of the NDPP or what? <coughs> what, would that, what would that do? Well, my lady, insofar as that is concerned, my lady would be able to look at the strength or weakness of the case. And, and then, so and I make, a, I make a, a value judgment. And then, my lady, if I may finish, 
as to whether the arrest, arrest would be justified, which is one of the prayers we seek. We're not asking you to decide the matter, if, if that's what Milady is, is um, suggesting. We're not. Well, as I understand your affidavit, the judicial peak is specifically for discovery. It is a method of discovery. And, and that's our, what your affidavit says. Yes. It's a method of discovery, Milady, that Milady would look at in circumstances of this case. In other words, we don't get it, you look at it. So in other words, any prejudice that the state may allege, which I'm going to deal with in a moment, they, don't, they shouldn't have, because they've actually waived their rights as to any privilege that they may have, which they don't have, to the contents of the docket, because they've leaked it to the press. We are actually finding about the strength and the weakness of the case from the press themselves. The admission, milady, in the papers, my learned friends make the admission that the investigation of this matter is complete. Now that is normally the trigger for disclosure. Now milady knows that the matter, if I may be forgiven for using this epigrammatic phrase, normally in a criminal trial the police arrest first and investigate later. So you're on the roll, and then they postpone the matter for, uh, until the matter is trial ready, and then you get disclosure. First and foremost, it's my humble submission, there's no case authority for that principle, but it is the practice. But in this case before Milady, my learned friends are suggesting that long before um, the issue of securing the attendance of my clients at court was considered, and long before the search and seizure warrant, they were trial ready. So when we ask you to have a look, to peek, there can be no prejudice to the state in, in this case because they're telling us they're trial ready. Now, one of the fundamental admissions the applicants make in their affidavit is they concede that it's common cause that the applicant has a, r a right to be presumed innocent. Now, an act of arrest, if one looks at the requirement of arrest, a reasonable suspicion, would suggest that actually you're not so innocent. So on the one hand, they say, yes, we do, pre we do believe that you are innocent. And in the very next breath, they are taking a step which would indicate that they're not applying that principle in this case on the facts available to Milady. <coughs> the respondent. Sorry, I don't understand your argument. As it pleases the court, Milady. They believe they admit that the accused is to be presumed, or my client is to be presumed innocent. Step one. Yeah. They then take a step which would indicate that she's not innocent because you have to have a reasonable suspicion for the purposes of arrest. I, I don't follow that. So are you saying that because there's such a right, nobody can ever be arrested? No, my lady. So what are you saying? I, I carefully said on the facts of this case, my lady. The respondents deny in their papers that the MP is responsible for, for the leaks of information. Well, my lady, where else could they have got it from? And then, in confirmation that the press have the contents of the docket, they admit that there's a 204 statement. So in my respectful submission, on their own papers, if one looks at the probabilities, in all likelihood, and since they're the only person who have the docket, the leaks are coming from them. Now, if one then looks at the issue of arrest, and I want to distinguish it from this case. I want to distinguish it from, from the, the case that Milady asked us to look at. As I, as I understand it, Milady, that dealt with the discretion of a presiding officer to intervene in, in an extradition case. And the actual act itself did not, um, it's the karma case, my lady. And the actual act itself did not allow 
the magistrate to exercise a discretion. So um, there was no discretion for the magistrate. If Milady looks at that letter, um, it's um, N M N two or double O two seventy six. Aside from what my learned friend has argued in that regard, he referred specifically to the issue of the summons being the appropriate, right at the beginning of the letter, the, su the summons on the facts of this case being the, being the appropriate method to, um, to secure the attendance of the accused at court. If the lady starts at pay 00281, and the lady proceeds through to double O eight eighty six. There's a whole history of standing orders issued um, on the authority of the various ministers of justice who have been in that office over that period of time. Now let's very briefly look at that, my lady. If, if my lady look, not the Minister of Justice, the Minister of Police, I'm sorry. Mm. If my lady looks at the act, my lady will see that the minister delegates to the National Commission of Police the duty to make standing orders and then provincial uh, commissioners in certain circumstances can make standing orders. The, the most important sections of those acts for this case is that the standing orders are binding on the, the employees of the minister, namely the South African police. And if Milady looks at these standing orders over this period of time, Milady will see that the requirements of when you arrest someone are clearly set out by the minister, the commissioners, if Milady follows the argument. And that is that arrest is a last resort. That is that if a person of whatever crime, a serious crime perhaps, if they have a home and address and circumstances in the jurisdiction of the court and so on and so forth, they listed in the standing orders, there is no need to arrest. And any police practice that there should be such an arrest to hit some arrest quota, for example, should be desisted immediately. They also say that, for example, even if you have a warrant of arrest, the police officer still exercises a discretion whether to use the warrant or not to secure the attendance of the accused at court. Now, it's our humble submission that on the facts of this case, even if there was a warrant, the circumstances when you should use another pathway to secure the attendance of the accused at court is available, you should use it. And the purpose of arrest is only to secure the attendance of the accused at court. No other reason. It's not to humiliate the accused, it's not to punish the accused, or anything like that. It is only to secure their attendance at court. And obviously our case is that can't be the reason why you want to arrest our client, because you've agreed, you're not opposing bail, you're not a flight risk, which would be the clarion call for arresting someone because they, that is, in those circumstances, the only basis upon which you can bring that person to court. <coughs> so throughout, as my learned friend has argued, there has been the threat of arrest as a prodding stick to try and secure the compliance of my client to conscript her to give evidence against herself. Now there's the issue of judicial peace. You will notice, milady, <coughs> other than scathing remarks in my learned friend's papers, they do not address the principles of judicial peace. So there's no serious dispute or resistance you having a look. 
And actually, Milady, um, insofar as your um, joke in your office is concerned, we hope you'd have more than just a peak. Now, the, um, when you exercise the issue of judicial peak... And if I have this judicial peak and then I say a read? Well, then... May I just take an instruction, Melinda? Yeah. My instruction is to argue, Milady, that that would have required a counter application before Milady. No, no, it's an exercise of my discretion. As it pleases the court, Milady. Um, when when uh, the state brief, the same principles of disclosure that you would look at for a doc formal application for a docket, you would look at now for the purposes of judicial peak. You would look at the A section comprises witness statements, the B section comprises internal reports, and the C section consists of the investigation officer's diary. Well, now, that's not what, what the, the, those are not, that sit out in the other application. But we are asking Milady to have a judicial peak, and Milady would look at those ins those legal instruments in the docket to decide um, whether the appreh apprehension of an unlawful arrest is justified. And once again, Milady, once again, as in a trial itself. For the purposes of arrest, we are entitled to know what case we have to meet. There would be an affidavit justifying the arrest. Your time is running out. I'll be very quick, milady. To justify the arrest. The most important point is, milady, that the onus is upon the state to justify why you shouldn't have a judicial peak. And nowhere in their papers have they addressed that issue. Where does, who tells me that they have the onus? I beg your pardon, Milady? What tells me that they have the onus on judicial peak? They, ha um, they have an onus to declare to Milady why you shouldn't look. That's Chabalala, King. So you don't have an onus. You just have to make the vermin. Yes. We have to adduce evidence, and they bear the onus. Now, they, once again, as I've argued before, have waived rights. Let's look at the categories in terms of which they can refuse you to have a judicial peak. They need to protect the identity of an informer. <coughs> now they've called their 204 witness in their papers a whistleblower, which is a hybrid of an informer. They need to keep police investigation secret while they disclose it to the press, so there's nothing secret in this matter. They need to protect witnesses from intimidation, well, in the disclosures to the press, they have not said the, the witnesses would be intimidated. The need to protect from disclosure the contents of treaties with other police authorities, that's not appropriate here. And the need to see whether the interests of justice would be defeated. Now, those are the requirements, but they've never dealt with those issues in their papers. Um, now, in paragraph 47, I am speeding up, my lady. At paragraph 47, um, I quote the Director of Public Prosecution Circular where those principles are upheld again. Now, I've addressed you on the issue of the Minister of Police. The, Director of Public, the Act of the Director of Public Prosecutions has the same um, line of reasoning that the, the, um, the prosecutors must comply with this regulation. Now, my lady. Why would this uh, uh, arrest be unlawful? It's contained in the submissions, in our submissions, in paragraph 48.1. They intend using a 204 witness. By virtue of the 204, the witness has to be an accomplice. Pervaded by the, a cloud of mystery and intrigue, the deal that was struck between that witness was that a matter in which it was alleged she was a fraudster would be withdrawn in return for her testimony against an accused in this matter. This would mean that the following cautionary rules would have to be applied in relation to that witness. 
You come please. please. I understand what a section 204 witness is set, upsetting many criminal matters. So, so, so what does this? What are you saying to me? Well, my lady, is this really? from the disclosure in the press, and the lady's going to, in my humble submission, look at the docket to see whether the disclosures are accurate. It would appear they have a weak case, which doesn't justify arrest. Now, the, dis the discourse of the conversation and who said what to my instructing attorney, Mr. May, should be in the C section of the doc. Now, allegations are made that events happen and there's an attempt to discredit Mr. May. But proof of the pudding would be that they w those allegations would have to be recorded in the C section. Um, Now, at um, paragraph 52, it's recorded the, st the Standing Order General 156 of the Media Communication in South Africa. The, I'll leave that for my lady to read. But the contents of the Standing Order hold out the following prospects to the respondents. This document is a liberal document which calls for a constitutional balanced approach to the rights of an accused. When disclosure was made to the press, it must have been a rational, reasonable decision, which would have meant that the decision was mindful of the rights held by the respondents having been waived. And I immediately asked my lady to look in the papers where the press are always in the belief that there's going to be an arrest. Why shouldn't we believe the press that that, that prospect is imminent? If it were an irrational decision, then the whole process of the investigation is fruit of the poison tree and the evidence obtained, therefore, inadmissible. The respondents can pick their poison. When the Honorable Court applies its mind to the issue of judicial peak, it is submitted that the state representatives have waived any rights that they might have had to non-disclosure and have assessed all the rights favorably for disclosure simply because of the disclosures they've made to the press. So why not give it to us? Why is, we, why is my client the last South African to know? There is therefore no rational reason why the defense should not have the same disclosure made to them now so that they are informed as to what case they have to meet and what pretrial representations they may make. There is a strong likelihood from what has been disclosed in the press that there will be no need to bring this matter to court. The major consideration that is that this fact should be confirmed by the best evidence available. That's why we're asking for you to peek. I refer to the, the case of um, Savoy and others versus the National Prosecuting Authority. Um, in my humble submission, um, the state are, might raise privilege. Now, my lady would know that the general privilege that the state had during the security state was overturned by um, the first Chabalala Constitutional Court decision. It's subsequently been confirmed in um, cases such as Pagnotti and King. So in um, the, <laughs> once again, in order to erase some sort of privilege, which is the content of the Zafoy case, the state have to put it out in their papers. There's nothing in there. So in my respectful submission, a proper case has been made out, one. In terms of the respondent's own standing orders, that an arrest in this matter is an unjustified, and two, that in order for Milady to satisfy herself, because Milady exercises judicial oversight, that that submission is correct. If there's any doubt, have a look, as it pleases the court. Sorry. Might I just take an instruction, Milady? As it pleases the court, Milady. Thank you very much. In the short space of time that we, we were given by the applicant to prepare for this matter, we prepared some short uh, written submissions. I do not intend though to 
repeat everything that we say therein. And from paragraph six, though, and we deal with the question of agents. And in paragraph thirteen and five. applicant brings an application on an urgent basis, not only must the applicant demonstrate that the application is urgent, but he must, they must also demonstrate that they may not get a repress uh, in due course. That is not uh, demonstrated before. It is said the application is urgent, we say it is not. But one thing that her leadership can, you can read to the founding of it, David, from A to Z, you will not find where the applicant says, I will not be able to get a substantial redress in due course. That on its own is fatal uh, in an application for agency, you know, or based on agency. I, like I just want to deal with this question of agency in detail, but I have these questions in my mind. Is it in the interest of justice that the NPA should work on the convenience and timetable that is set by an attorney? In a simple matter where it's not a trial, it's just a question of handing over your client so that he is processed and then is taken to court. Would it be in the interest of justice? And if, if so, what is that going to do uh, to the public confidence uh, in the criminal justice system going forward? Where we have applicants who will simply say, wait for me, wait until I'm done. In fact, in this case, if, if, the, if the applicant was in hospital, it would be a different story. In this case, it's not even the convenience of the applicant. It is the convenience of the attorney. The, the leadership is going to ask me, doesn't she have a right um, to an attorney or to be legally represented? We, we, we accept that uh, there is generally a right to legal representation, but Section 35 is specific of the Constitution. At this stage, the applicant is neither arrested, is not detained, is not accused. At this stage, she is just a suspect. Section 35 is specific as to who has those rights. It is a person who is arrested, I, I, I propose not to read, but sub subsection three uh, is specific to a person who is accused. Once the, uh, once the applicant appears once the applicant is handed over, he is, she is told of the charges against her. It is at that stage that the obligations, for instance, to, to inform her of her rights, uh, uh, even the right to legal representation arises. But at that stage, then she becomes entitled to, to legal representation. At this stage, to say... Not only that, the case, the case will not over and over see that you are right, you have a right to legal representation, but not to a specific legal representation. Yes, well, yes. From, from, from the time we, con we conducted her, from the time we conducted her, the purpose of conducting her was twofold. And, and, that, and that relationship was on the 8th of, of, of March. The, the purpose was twofold, to inform her that we intend to take her to court. And uh, Mr. Perlman says, I asked her who his legal who her legal representation is because these are legal matters, and Mr. Perlman waited until she got a, a, an opportunity to appoint the legal representative. So there is no denial of uh, the applicant's legal right to legal representation. In any event, strictly speaking, at this moment she is only a suspect. I don't understand the argument by my, my, my friend that she is presumed innocent, but she, she is taken. I, I, I couldn't follow that philosophy. Yes. <coughs> but the leadership, is this matter urgent? Because his leadership must, must also consider that. 
This is what we say this matter is not right. On the 8th of April, as I said, the applicant was conducted. And March. March. <laughs> <laughs> it is this 9th of April that uh, what is speaking of. And then on the 9th of, of March, uh, your ladyship, uh, she was, it is then that she was specifically informed that we intend to take you to court. And uh, she was told that a decision to that effect has been taken. As for the details of the legal representation, and she promised that I will revert on that one. Again, on the 11th of March, a, two communications were done by WhatsApp and uh, by a direct call. Uh, again, it was indicated that uh, we intended to secure her attendance in court, and that we gave a date, we said at least by the 13th of March, which is now gone. She said she would only be back on the 16th of March. We accepted that. And then the applicants attend, get involved on the, on the 17th of March. The first thing that, she, that, that the attorney does is that uh, he requests copies of the docket. Up to so far, it is unheard of that copies of the docket can be disclosed or can be demanded uh, for any other purpose, like as they say in paragraph 12.4, I think, of the, found, of the founding of David, that they want to defend themselves against the media. That is not the purpose of uh, disclosing them, the, the evidential docket. And, and, on, and of course, he indicated that you would only be available on the, on the 3rd of, of April. But there has been a discussion. First, it was this, they discussed that can he be available on the 20th? This is after he has said uh, on the 3rd of, of <coughs> April. Can you be available on the, on the, 20, on the 20th of, um, of March? Can you be available on the, 22nd, on the 22nd of March? All these are the in engagements that are, 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 are between them. And fundamentally, there is no, nothing that was ever said to the fact that we want to arrest your client. All that is said is bring your client with yourself. And the, um, the, the deponent to the answer in Africa says, I even told them that we want to do this, this, this matter as seamless as possible. All right. And then your lordship, on the 19th of March, this is, this is now I, I'm talking about the, the topic of undertaking. On the 19th of March, there's a, there's a discussion between Mr. Perlman and the applicants legal representative. In that discussion, it, you find it in our answering affidavit in, in paragraphs 40 to 51. In that discussion, uh, your ladyship, the applicants legal representatives ask for an undertaking. He says, please give me an undertaking that my client is not going to be arrested. That undertaking was not given on the 19th of March. And then your leadership, still on the 17th of March, <coughs> she is, the applicant's legal representative is informed by the public prosecutor now that we want your client to come, present herself at a police station, Littleton police station. We process your client. She goes to court. We are not going to oppose bail. It, it was made up front. In, 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 I'm, I'm making an emphasis on this, your leadership, so that his leadership is aware that there is no threat of a detention. This is a matter of, it's a procedural matter to process uh, at the person so that the matter is enrolled and uh, the trial gets underway. But importantly, your leadership, um, on the 19th, still, the applicant's attorney writes a letter. Uh, my learned friend has write, read that letter, but we deal with it in paragraph 66.11, um, the paragraph 66, but particularly at paragraph 66.11 of our answer in affidavit. We point out that in that letter, the applicant's legal representative requested an undertaking. This is now on the 19th uh, of March. The undertaking was not given. Then what they do? On the 22nd, they bring an application. That is on Friday. 
last week. They bring an application on the basis that an undertaking not to arrest has not been given. They set that application on the 9th of, um, of April. Barely a few hours, let's say five hours, six hours, the applicant's legal representative asks for an undertaking that there is not going to be arrest. The application has now been served. The application was served around 6 in the morning, uh, around 11 ish during the day. He asked for an undertaking. And if you do not give the undertaking, I am going to court on an urgent basis at 3 o'clock this afternoon. The undertaking is still not given. Then on Saturday, um, that is the day before yesterday, they bring an application. On what basis do they bring the application? On the basis that the undertaking has not been given. Now, the undertaking was never given at any stage prior to the 22nd, or even prior to the 23rd. It was never given. And when the undertaking was not given, they set the matter down on the 9th of April. But on the same ground of not giving the undertaking, then they say they are anticipating um, the, the, um, the, the, the date and they are bringing it forward to today. Not only <coughs> do they not comply uh, with the practice directive, they do not give us sufficient time to prepare the affidavit and to, to prepare a proper argument to present before you. Uh, now, they, they say, um, the applicant says, perhaps I need to refer this time to, to it is page 16, uh, your uh, double, double zero dash 16. Thank you, my lady. The, the, the focal point would be paragraph 36, but in, in, in the preceding paragraphs, they refer to a communication between Mr. Manyati and uh, the applicants attend. And um, the, the attorney writes a, a message to Mr. Advocate Manyati. He says, we haven't heard from you in read the application served and received by yourself this morning. So it's on Friday. He says we have not heard from you. Bearing in mind that in, in the notice of motion we are told to, to react by the 26th. It's far, it's still way before the 26th. <coughs> um, we have been watching the reports in the media which seem to indicate an imminent arrest and even on one which stated that my client had lied about her whereabouts. The media has also congregated around my client's house, no doubt in anticipation of such arrest. I'm, I'm going to deal with the so-called leaks uh, later on. And then he says, we have taken the decision to accelerate um, and seek an agent interim interdict against Mike, um, to interdict, I think he wanted to say arrest against, or against my client's arrest at 1,500 hours today. Uh, mark that today. Uh, today in Pretoria High Court. And let, let me not read further. Then in paragraph 35, Mr. Maniati responds to that message. We have no control over the media. The fact that the media has congregated at their place, it, at, at least not at our instance, we have no control of that. And then he says, there is no imminent arrest and therefore no need for an urgent interim relief today. Remember, he said, I'm going to court today. And he says, no, you don't, there's no need to go to, to court today. There's no imminent arrest. We are not arresting. And then <coughs> uh, in paragraph 36, can you get, can you get me? Our response to paragraph 36 in the answer affidavit. In, in paragraph 36, they say they accepted what Mr. Manyati said um, 
And uh, we accepted that this removed the need for urgent interim relief until we became aware of comments which Mr. Manyati had given to the press, which was as follows. Then says, mm -hmm. not my WhatsApp, I don't know what that means. Evidence, evidence by SGM6, that's the annex chair uh, to the f founding of it, David. Being a media report published at uh, 600 hours in the morning, this now is on Saturday. Yes, we actually said very clearly, not today. Nothing less, nothing more. This is exactly what is contained in paragraph 5. Um, in, paragraphs, in, in paragraph 5, read in context with, what, with the discussion that they had, he said there is no imminent arrest and no, no need for an interim interdict today. But then they say this has escalated the urgency of this matter. We say, my lord, my lady, that w whether one interprets this to mean that uh, <coughs> the arrest was not going to happen on Friday only is of no moment. Of no moment because we have never given an undertaking that there is not going to be an arrest. So if the matter was urgent, was urgent because we did not give an undertaking, it would not, it, it, it would, and they needed an, an urgent relief as in today, they would not have set down the matter down. They would not have set the matter down for the 9th of April. They would have brought it today. But the point we're making is this is an abuse of court process. You can't allow a litigant to initiate a process and when that process has been initiated, he abandons. He takes the matter out of the court road, having jumped the queue, wants to jump the queue again. That should not be countermanced. <coughs> I need not emphasize the point that the practice directive has not been complied with. We are here on, 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 uh, on Monday. At least there has to be an explanation in the affidavit why one cannot wait for Tuesday, why the papers could not be made ready on a Thursday, 12 o'clock. The, the, other, the other aspect I would like to deal with uh, is then uh, if if his if her ladyship finds that the matter is urgent, um, then the applicant has got to demonstrate the requirements for an interim interdict. I want to start with the irreparable harm because that is what my learned friend has dealt with, and uh, he dealt with the irreparable harm by reference to the case. Uh, in Johannesburg, uh, in the matter between the president and uh, the other president. What was the court dealing with in that, in that matter? The court, uh, a Southern DJP, was dealing with an unlawful prosecution by a private prosecutor. Unlawful prosecution by a private prosecutor. First, the Although in, in the affidavit they say the arrest hearing is unlawful, it is not substantiated why it is, it is, it is un unlawful. And your Lordship, at this stage, it cannot be assessed that the, the arrest is going to be unlawful or is unlawful. Once it is happened, then one can, start, can, can look back and check if it is, it is unlawful. But the facts are distinguishable in the sense that that was an unlawful prosecution by a private prosecutor, not the, the NBA has been statutorily assigned the function of ma managing the prosecution. Not necessarily the private prosecutors, but worse of all, when the summons issued by the pres private prosecutor are unlawful. What then uh, Judge Sutherland says is that, <coughs> I'm, I'm, I'm talking of the import of what he's saying. He says, the irreparable harm in, um, Would, would result by virtue of submitting to that unlawful prosecution. This is not an unlawful prosecution, uh, as we said. And this is not an unlawful arrest as well. Uh, your, your Lordship will make the point that uh, 
there is no one who would claim a right not to be arrested because this is what uh, the issue is here. Uh, and the I do not understand this preference that the applicant seeks to be treated specially. What the, the, the prosecution is doing is acting within the law, but the applicant has her own preferences how this, thing, this, 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 this process should be undertaken. If we were to allow that, we are going to have a huge problem in the sense that all 57 million people in South Africa, if, ah, let's, let's say half of them, not, 50, not all of them can be charged. Because the, ja because, because the judges, the judges will be The majority of people will always say, no, don't call me to court this way. Call me to court that way. Then we would never exercise our discretion. We might as well forget about the discretion that the law gives to us. We, we might as well just go and beg to the accused, to the suspect, as to what must we do then in the circumstances. But, but this case demonstrates the problem that we will, we, will have, we will encounter. Someone will say, I want to be arrested, I want to appear in court, I want to come to hand myself in court in November because I have these other things that I need to do before, before that. that. That is undesirable. That is not in the interest of justice. Mr. Day, our argument is only two weeks. So it's reasonable. It, it, it is not. It is no, no, no. It is not reasonable in so far as they want an undertaking from us. <coughs> we what what we have done. We have been cautious to them. We did not just go and arrest. We could have done that. We could have just gone and arrested and, and arrested. But we chose not to do that. We said. Let's do it in a seamless way. And uh, this seamless way, your, 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 your leadership, I submit, is also less uh, ev invasive because we are not taking, she, she is brought by the attend, they, she is taken to the court by the attend. All we want is so that the court can fix bail. That's all. Our, our colleagues, they say, let, let, let us issue summons. If you do that, then there, it will never be an issue about, there will never be a talk about bail. In other words, the court will not be given an opportunity to fix bail. But, but whether, whether, whether that is the case or not, the, 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 her leadership will urge her to bear in mind that an arrest is one of the legal ways uh, that um, are statutorily available uh, to, to the officers. Now, what the applicants are doing, <coughs> they want to frustrate us uh, in the performance of our statutory function. <coughs> now, we, 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 we refer you uh, in, in our heads to the case of Porter, where, you, where it is said if you are interdicting the functionary from performing its statutory function, then the bar is high. There, there is no exceptional circumstances that have been demonstrated here. The, the best they do, they say, this is a Speaker of Parliament. Um, there is an ANC constitution that says if he is charged, she is charged, she will be required to step aside. We, we can only read those as the exceptional circumstances that they are putting forward. Those, those are certainly not exceptional circumstances. We submit your leadership that the law knows no, no positions. The fact that I am an advocate, the law, when it has to grind, it must grind. It will not wait for me until I... I, I it will not grind, grind now, differently. Do you think, well, arrest, arrest should be the last resort? The, the, the should rather use the summons procedure on these facts? The, 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 well, we don't even know what those facts are. But what we know is Section 40 of the Criminal Procedure Act tells us the circumstances under which an arrest uh, can be done. All we need to do is to comply with section four. If if we comply with section four, if our arrest, if the arrest, if we exercise our our discretion properly, and which is something that can be assessed after it has been done, uh, there, there, there can be no question at all. Which 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 your question also brings me to, to what is called.
the judicial pick. Maybe I should just um, look into that as well. <coughs> Here they want, they want this court to look at the docket and decide whether on the facts that, on the evidence that is in the docket, there is a ground to arrest. That is not a function of the court to do so. That function is assigned uh, in terms of section 40 to the, to, the, to the police. Once they have, for instance, once they have a reasonable suspicion that an offense has been committed, then they can arrest. It doesn't go further than that. Second, uh, we view this submission of a judicial pick as a review by Bechtel. They want her ladyship to review the decision. Um, but they do not come up forthright to, to ask for a review. But in effect, this is a review. It is not, um, it is not appropriate, your ladyship. But also, we submit that the, the judicial pick um, cannot be done in this matter because when, 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 when the applicant seeks a relief, he must, she must present evidence. In this case, the applicant was supposed to say, I have the docket, here it is, and submit it to the court and say, look at it, court, um, it does it warrant it. But they have not given you that opportunity. You don't, in the papers that are before you, you don't have anything to pick into. The relationship, uh, this, you are in court on an urgent basis today, for instance. The applicant is re represented by a contingent of four <coughs> legal representatives. What is the problem? Why couldn't they just take the applicant today, for instance, now that they are in court? I understand the, the Mr. May is not here, but why, why can't the attorney who is present in court take the applicant to, to the police station today? There's, there's no reason at all. I also have got a problem with the prospects of success in the main application that we are seeking. They are seeking. So I want to ask you, let's for a moment accept, and I'm just playing the enormous advocate, that I find that it is urgent. Yeah. If I should rule on the arrest and the judicial plea, that court will be bound by what I had said. Definitely. And that matter would morally basically fall away. Fall away, yes. Definitely, that would, that it will fall away. But, but let's 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 look at the prospects of success in that matter. They, the, the, the prayer they seek is a final thing that is that their client, the, the applicant, should not be arrested at all. That's the first prayer. But why would the applicant not be arrested at all when the law? says we are all equal before the law. Section 9 applies, uh, the law applies to the applicant as well, in, a, in the same way as it applies to me. Why should she not be arrested at all? Because that's what the, the relief they are seeking. That order is, in, is undesirable. And it, it is without any condition. Do not arrest me. So if the applicant is not arrested, she may, in fact, she may, in fact, decide not to go to court because she has got an order that she cannot be arrested. Even if you were to serve th those summons, you can't, you can't arrest me. I've got an order. So that 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 relief is undesirable, is inappropriate. In pa in paragraph three of the notice of motion in that application of April, they seek access to to the docket, as Helen should knows. Mm. But at this stage, it is not yet a trial stage. We have referred in the answer, we have quoted a case in the answer of the the case of um, Shabala. That right to access the docket. The, the I'm not following the argument. The argument seems to be because you've now said that the investigation is closed. That seems to be what triggers when you're entitled to the docket. 
with the investigation. That seems to be the trigger. <laughs> In other words, they are saying an, a suspect yeah. is entitled to the docket. At a stage, oh, at a stage when she has not been charged, when she has not been informed of the of the of the charge against her, when she is not at a stage where she is preparing for a trial, that does not make sense to me at all. Well, is that practice at the moment? No, no. Hence, I say it, it is unheard of. I, I was hearing it for the first time that uh, one can demand. What, what we know from the law is that an access to the docket is given so that the accused person prepares for the trial, yes. In any event, what we submit in this regard, it can never be urgent at this stage that one have access to, to the docket. Uh, the Lordship, the fact that we wanted, the fact that we wanted, the, the fact that the submission is that it is only a matter of two weeks, it seems that uh, it goes back to what I'm saying that it would be treating people according to their preferences and according to their status in the society, which is something that cannot be accepted. <coughs> if, we, if, if we make that undertaking, then tomorrow every other suspected person is going to, to, to be here in court and say, please tell NPA that I want to go to court in May. That, that cannot be countenance. It will collapse the, the, the justice system. May I just take in certain is, is it type of research? Thank you. Okay. But, but we, we have set out in the Africa um, the facts that demonstrate that uh, the charges that are preferred against, uh, that to be preferred against the, the suspect, the applicant, uh, fit in within, say, say Schedule 5 uh, offense, which brings in the provisions. Schedule 5? Yes. Um, it, it would be section 6, subsection 11, subsection B, which says, notwithstanding any provisions of this act, where an accused person, an accused person, a person who has been processed, the fingerprints taken and so on, is charged with an offense referred to in Schedule 5, but not in Schedule 6, the court shall order, shall order, that the accused be detained in custody until he or she is dealt with in accordance with the law, unless the accused, having be, been given a reasonable opportunity to do so, adduces evidence which satisfies the court judge. It is in the interest, oh, sorry, the interest of justice permit his or her release. In other words, we are dealing with a situation where this person must go to court. In, in fact, in fact, this argument that she must she must come by someone's is neither here nor there because at the end of the day she must be processed, which is what we want to do, and then she must appear in court and be dealt with in terms of this section. So it's it's a it's really a preference that should not be permitted uh, to the to the to to, to the applicant. The, the relationship, uh, my junior wants me to deal with this thing now. I wanted to deal with it at a later stage. We, we, we are told that we are leaking information with this. Uh, we are leaking information to, to, the, um, to the media. And we are not told who of us is, is uh, leaking information to the media. I want to demonstrate to, to your leadership now uh, what, what, for instance, they say in paragraph 35 of the Affirmative Africa, when they say Mr. Mzinyati has spoken with the media and told them 
that we are not going to arrest today. Mr. Mzinyati, in paragraph one, I, I'll give your leadership the, uh, the page number. Uh, it's page 61 to 62 at uh, five, and I, section five, zero zero five dash 61, I mean zero zero five dash 61. Um, uh, in, in paragraph 103.3, he says, I deny vehemently that I have ever spoken to any journalist or media house in relation to this matter. Uh, therefore, the allegation, the alleged comment by me is denied. Much as you have not been given a, 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 um, an audio discussion by, between him, uh, allegedly between him and, and the journalist, but what they do, they simply ascribe that to, 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 to him. They talk o about us leaking the Section 204 statement but they do not tell us who led to that section 204 statement. What I I I, I do not understand all, all these allegations. Your Lordship, we take a dim view to these allegations. We have no responsibility on what the media reports, how the media we've got a, a, a media liaison person. We issue press statements. We don't have we don't deal with un identified sources. So if they say we have leaked information, they must identify that person. Tell us when, who, and how was, was the leak done. My learned friend has read to you uh, the, the letter um, where we said, where it was said, if, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, if you do not come, if you do not bring your client, then we will then be forced to resort to Section 40, which is a last resort. That also tells you already that we don't have an intention of simply arresting this, this person for no for nefarious reasons, as they say. We've given her the, the courtesy, we have applied the less evasive men, but what she cannot do is to prescribe how we should handle the matter. The Lordship will ask in the end Oh, by the way, insofar as the balance of convenience, nothing is said in the founding of David at all. So that too has not been has not been has not been established. The applicant Basics, the, basically, he says, she says, her right to dignity, her right to freedom of movement, those are the rights that, that <coughs> are I will deal with the right to dignity and good reputation, as they put it now. The, the, the freedom of person is not unduly interfered with by the process of her presenting herself in court and then being taken to... So I don't think you're going to have to address me on that. Yeah. I find that, that that is what you want, so you don't have to. As, as a court please, is a legend. The, the, the dignity, because of the media that has reported uh, widely on this, any dignity that she has uh, is not going to be repaired by her not being uh, called upon to court. The media has already, the, in fact, there will always be those suspicions even if we were not to, to prosecute her. So if, if there was any reputation, there was a reputation I accept. She has got a reputation, but that reputation has been damaged already by the media. There is nothing to protect any further, at least not by way of this interdict. We submit your leadership that you should strike off this application because uh, of lack of agency, non-compliance with the practice directive, and in particular because they are not making a case that they will not suffer any repairable harm. And if his leadership, if her leadership is with us, we submit that uh, the cost um, should include the cost of two counsel. Thank you very much.
and the partners. So ladyship pleases. Milady, I, I do believe that your ladyship does recognize the element of the applicant's case relating to her choice of attorney, of having the attorney of her choice represent her at every procedural step. We've already pointed out, and they make no case, that they've ever conducted themselves in accordance with judges' rules or with standing orders. Um, Mr. Mr. Kerr Phillips pointed out what they ought to have done on the day that they first phoned her. They should have read her, her rights per judge's rules. Equally, on the day they decided to sidestep Mr. May, sending Mr. Schmidt, they also don't tell you that they did that there. So what you have, with respect, is a delinquent group of people pursuing this applicant. They cannot Sorry, show... Milady, I don't understand you. You reply. I'm to replying. What was, what, in, to what was said? To what are you replying? Now saying the link with people. What, well, Milady, Mila Mila if your ladyship would listen to me, just as you listened so nicely to my learned friend, your ladyship would allow me to develop my argument and make the point I'm going to make. In reply. In reply, yes, Milady. I've, I've, I've said practically nothing, and your ladyship has interrupted me. I must prevail in your ladyship to please allow me to develop this. You have 15 minutes in reply. As your ladyship pleases. So the point is, my lady, in their case, my learned friend has not been able to argue one thing to you that can satisfy your ladyship that this group of people named in the papers, named in, and cited in the papers, have conducted themselves in accordance with the law. He hasn't argued anything to justify their actions and to overcome the probabilities of the case made out on the applicant's papers and that's the Webster Mitchell test. But what he does tell your ladyship and your ladyship clearly has, has um, tended to agree with him but he's misleading your ladyship correct, on the correctness of this is that our client doesn't have a right to choose her attorney. It's all over the Criminal Procedure Act it's all over the authorities, and it's in the Constitution, my lady. We are abjectly horrified that we have to make this submission. I'll start in the Constitution. Section 35, arrested, detained, and accused persons. Everyone who is arrested for allegedly committing an offence has the right. We go down to 35.3. Every accused person has a right to a fair trial, which includes the right to be informed of the charge with sufficient detail to answer it. We don't even have a charge yet. We get to F, to choose and be represented by a legal practitioner and to be informed of this right promptly. They didn't inform her when they first telephoned her. They just said they want to know who her attorney is. Section 73.2, capital A of the Criminal Procedure Act. Every accused shall be informed of his or her right to be represented at his or her own expense by a legal advisor by his or her own choice. And if he or she cannot afford legal representation, etc. Choice, my lady. I can go on. There are authorities. Um, there are, there's precedent, my lady. I'll just have my attorney pass me. Where is this? Where is this from? No, but where is it? Where are we leaving from? So, Milady, I'm going to give you what is cited in, in State versus Philemon. That's 1997, brackets two, South African Criminal Law Reports. That's 651 W. Relating to Section 73 2A of the Criminal Procedure Act. An accused must be afforded. What page or paragraph are you reading? Um, there's no, it's, it's, it's not reading from a paragraph. This is, I'm reading, I'm reading here a submission and that's, you'll find the submission founded in State versus Philemon, my lady. I can't give better than that, my lady. I'll, 
Um, let me just see if there's something in the next. Um, lady, there's also the other authority that sustains this is state verse um, Magawazuma, M A G, I think it's a, a B, or it could be an H, U W A X U M A, and that's 1997 brackets 2, South African Criminal Law Report 675, and that's out of the CPD in those days. But this is the proposition, my lady, and that's supported by the authority. An accused must be afforded a reasonable opportunity to obtain the assistance of a lawyer of choice. And then that's where Philemon comes in. Philemon comes in, my lady. During the intervening period, the prosecution must hold off and initiate no steps which may be prejudicial to an accused. An accused can, therefore, not be compelled to plead to a charge until representation has been secured. Even during the trial, the necessary opportunity should be afforded. The fact that the accused is an attorney does not mean he or she is not entitled to legal representation, and it is irregular to dismiss his application for a postponement to obtain legal representation. And that's the, the Magawazuma case, my lady. So, my lady, that is central. It's a central feature to our case, how they've continually attempted to denude the applicant of her legal representation by Mr. May. My learned friends comment that, oh, well, we could go and do it. That doesn't, that doesn't um, hold water, my lady. He is her attorney. He is given, as her ladyship correctly pointed out, is his argument, he gave a two-week period, a reasonable period. They simply would not abide that. Why? For reasons we don't know. The... <coughs> My learned friend's comment, my lady, just doesn't even bear, bear response, really. We must tell them who leaked. Well, who leaked it? We didn't leak it. They were the only ones in possession of the 205 statement, 204 statement. It's the only inference your ladyship can draw from that is that they are behind that. And we're not coming here, and he puts forward a, 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 the childish argument that we're dictating to the NPA that, well, we've got a couple of things to do over the next couple of months. Come and see us. My lady, with respect, that's not, that just doesn't, it just doesn't bear comment. Your ladyship understands our, um, our comment. My lady, your ladyship expressed the view that the court would be bound by a finding. Absolutely not, my lady. Your ladyship's making an interim finding. You're not making a final finding. You're making an interim finding on the Webster-Mitchell test. Even if you took a peek and you said, well, I've looked at it, I think there's adequate here. No subsequent... No, my lady, you don't have to, f you are finding, my lady, for an interdict, an interim interdict. Does she have a right? Is there a right she can stand on? Well, there are a few in the Constitution. To not be arrested. No, 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 my lady, it's not to not be arrested. It's not to be unlawfully arrested in the reasonable apprehension of that being what they are doing. They are going to unlawfully arrest me, and then, my lady, their retort is, well, you've got a claim for damages. But what his lordship, Mr. Deputy Judge President, says, uh, uh, Sutherland says, he says, that's not the test. He says it's just unsustainable. The point is, if you foresee and you reasonably foresee, so she's entitled to reasonably believe on, obje on, on reasonably objective facts, which we've put to you, that she's going to be arrested when there's no need to arrest her. In other words, there's some other purpose behind the arrest of her. And arresting her within a period of days instead of just allowing for the two weeks. Now, we've put all of those facts before your ladyship. She doesn't say, say she has a right not to be arrested. Her so you're saying she, the, the, the founding affidavit sets out that she will be unlawfully arrested? Absolutely, my lady. I, Milady, I must. I, I, this, Milady, if this is how the Speaker of Parliament, the second most influential individual in our constitutional democracy, if this is how she is treated, well, then the rest of us in this courtroom better not get our hopes too high as to our constitutional rights <laughs> being afforded any legitimacy by the NPA.
and those who work under it. And I repeat, they cannot make out a case that their conduct is anything other than delinquent in this matter in regard to, to, the, uh, to the, the speaker as an individual, as a citizen. And lady, my learned friend has not addressed you on any aspect of our case that is not weak. He has put no substantial argument to your ladyship. And your ladyship will not be making any findings that bind another court. They're only interim. It's only interim. That's why, my lady, they'd have no right of, um, right of appeal, automatic right of appeal. Well, no, they have no claim to leave to appeal because it would be interim unless, of course, it is of final effect. Well, the same for you, then, I would assume. Well, no, if we, if we lose, it is of final effect. Oh. We can go on appeal. We can, or we can apply for leave to appeal. But they can't do it. And that's why, my lady, my learned friend is entirely wrong. Now the court's bound by this. Um, lady, the outer case raised in paragraph 17. But there's a fundamental difference. When you take an administrative decision of a, of, a, of a state functionary on review, that is what you do. You take them on review. Whatever decision they've made continues. If you want to interdict that thing that they've made a decision about to stop, you have to have, the threshold is high, you have to have a compelling case, exceptional circumstances, because you've already got a remedy, which is review. We don't have a review at our disposal. Once we've been arrested and it was unlawful, damages claim, our learned friend says, when five years from now, when uh, Madam Speaker then, as a much older lady, is in her early 70s, how does she recoup? What she seeks to do is to protect her dignity, to pre protect her right to freedom. I've I made submissions on that, including her right not to, not to be defamed or not to have her reputation impugned. Um, Milady, there's... I don't understand my learned friend's case, and I don't know if your ladyship does. He says they've never given an undertaking not to arrest. That's the whole point. You needed to give us an undertaking not to arrest so that we didn't have to go to court to protect our rights. They still weren't given an undertaking not to arrest her, but yet, yet part of these arguments seems to suggest that, well, he's, as if he's trying to tell me that what they're trying to tell the court in the papers is that they won't arrest her. I, Milady, you will not find the answer on their papers. Um, Milady, with respect, Mr. May picked up the telephone, had discussions with both functionaries, said I'm available in two weeks' time. Um, he gave them the reason why he wasn't available. It wasn't even necessary that obligation on him. He's quite right. In the meantime, of course, the Speaker is sitting waiting on her legal representative, of course, to make the arrangements. She's done nothing wrong, but she's the one who's got to be arrested. But Mr. May's done nothing wrong. It's them who've done everything wrong. They've been irrational, unreasonable. They haven't, they haven't obeyed their own rules. Uh, it's all over our papers, my lady. Um, well, our learned friend says she's only a suspect. My lady, that's, that's not the correct characterization of how she's been treated. There's a 204 statement that got leaked to the press. Couldn't have been leaked by anyone other than then one of the respondents or their representatives, and then that's, that's them. Um, and she is not just a suspect, she is accused in a 204 statement by someone else who's accused in something else. Your ladyship understands the, the mechanics of a 204 statement. She is an accused person. So my learned friend simply mischaracterizes uh, uh, the the description. Um, so your argument is saying she's an accused because of the leaks. 
No, 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 no. Because of the leaks no, no. of the 2.04. No, it's not because of the leaks, my lady. We know about it because of the leaks. So why is she a suspect? Oh, no, no, they say she's a suspect. Why is she an arrested person? Why is she an why arrested person? Is, as you argue. No, no, I didn't say she's an arrested person. What is she doing? She is, in, she is effectively an accused individual. All she needs is the charge sheet. And in terms of what is she an accused? The 204 statement. But, but lady, this is all set out in the papers. That 204 statement, is, we've, we've put up that article. But lady, it's, it's, it's crucial. I've, I've, I don't know how your ladyship will deal with this because uh, when we leave here, my lady, we need some sort of protection. Your ladyship will no doubt reserve judgment, I, I suspect. Reserve judgment. And would, your ladyship would need to give us some sort of protection, of course, in all the circumstances of your ladyship standing down. We appreciate that. But, um, my lady, it's all set out in our papers. Um, Lady, requesting the information in the docket, Mr. Kerr Phillips made the submission that the triggering point effectively is when you finish the investigation because there's no prejudice to you. And once I am an accused person and I'm going to be arraigned, put into a docket, even if it was by my cooperation, I'm entitled to the, do I'm entitled to the docket. Now, there's no authority that says I'm not. My learned friend didn't point you to any authority that says I'm not. But all the principles say, the fundamentals of, our, of what underpin our Constitution is that the minute my constitutional rights are, in, are, are affected, imperiled, activated by something, I'm entitled to disclosure so that I can protect them. Um, to say this matter is not urgent, my lady, we came... Your ladyship knows Luna Meebles. We looked at the exigencies. We truncated the time periods. We'd already tried not to rush to court in the first one. So we get criticized when we give them time from Friday morning until the 9th of March, allowing for the matter to ripen and everything to happen. They don't give us an undertaking. Then we're forced to come on to, to expedite the matter or to anticipate our own relief on truncated periods, and we criticise for that too. You're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't when it comes to the National Prosecuting Authority, evidently. We came, we gave them time, and they did put papers in. And we hear this morning, he says, well, we didn't say why, we can't be a Tuesday. Because you're going to arrest us on any day now. Getting into your ladyship's court this morning at 10 o'clock, that, that was where we needed to be to be safe. Because we cannot keep living with the uncertainty. Our client cannot live with uncertainty. Will it be today? Will it be tomorrow? Because why, then why didn't they tell us, Mr. May, we are not going to arrest your client. But if you don't come on Friday, we'll tell the magistrate and then we'll have the magistrate issue a, a, a warrant for her arrest at that point in time. Well, I'll tell you what the problem is. They have all Mr. May's letters. And now there are applications. And they never would get a warrant. That's why they threatened us with Section 40, because they'll just arrest without a warrant. Continual threat, continual terror tactics. That's how they are treating the applicant, our client. And it has to stop, and she seeks an interdict, my lady. It is, it is literally as simple as that. My lady, of course, we, we seek that if you find for the applicant and you grant her um, her interim relief, you have two options, really, on costs, and that is either to reserve the costs for another court or to grant um, us those costs, my lady. We leave that in your ladyship's discretion. My lady, I, my learned friend did not indicate whether they have brought the docket and state brief to court. Um, you would have seen in the notice of motion under what they are to do if they wish to oppose, they had to bring their, an answering affidavit, they had to serve one, and then to bring the state brief. Maybe they should... Uh, just to answer on whether or not they've, um, they have that at court, my lady. Do you want to answer that too? <laughs> no, we, we did not bring the judgment. Why is it in the, in the papers that we need to pray for that we should bring the judgment? Lady, if you go to the notice of motion, you'll find that at section 02-3 uh, on page 3, um, point three reads, to deliver any opposing affidavit 
by email by no later than 4 o'clock on Sunday, 24 March, as well as to ensure that the state brief, including the docket, is brought to court. No, we did not bring that. There is no provision in the rule that we should... We should if they wanted a docket, they would have made a prayer in the notice of motion. They have not done so. My lord, uh, my lady, the notice of motion reads at paragraph 3 that the above court exercises its discretion and take a judicial peek into the state's brief, including its docket, to decide this application in the event of opposition. My lady, on these papers... Yes, yes. So Milady, but just move on because your 15 minutes is now Yes. Gone. So Milady, Milady, what you what you have before you, Milady, is an application. It has not been answered. You know, look at what they say. It's just a bold denial. They have not answered our application. We've explained to your ladyship on the law why we say we're entitled to what we say. And we verily believe, Milady, that all of the authority is in our favour. But they may as well not have opposed because they've said nothing of substance in their answering affidavit. They could have just come to court and criticized us on the same basis. Because there's no substance here. There's no proper dispute effect. And they do not show themselves to be anything but delinquent. And that, my lady, certainly takes us over the line. Because our probabil the probabilities on are established on our case. They're not, well, firstly, it's our, and it's our version. So we just only have to deal with things that they would say that we can't dispute. But they don't say anything that we can't dispute that hurts us. Milady, we submit that the, the a proper case has been made out for it. We've asked for the relief in the um, notice of motion. Of course, the, the, the judicial peak note um, relief, it's there if necessary. If your ladyship finds in our favor, well, then you don't have to look at it if you're satisfied. But if you have doubts, you would take a peek into the docket and say, well, let me make sure that I am not making myself party to what these people are up to. Milady, that's our argument. I don't think her, Jason, that is our case. Milady, we would ask that your ladyship give us some sort of protection from today on, even if it's an undertaking from our learned friends from the bar. Um, and Milady, if your ladyship is not with us, we would ask your ladyship then to consider under alternative remedy relief, whether you're nonetheless in regulating the process and making sure that there's a, a logical end to this, um, wouldn't direct that the parties nonetheless uh, engage with a view. Because the 3rd of April is next, is next week. And you've seen we've made ourselves um, accountable and committed to the process all along the ladies. So you're not following. So if I'm not with you, you want me to under alternative relief say what? I'm suggesting that if you're not with us, that under alternative relief you could still direct that the parties on the third, because we've said we're available, and they haven't said they're not available on, on the third of April, that the parties nonetheless must engage process do whatever's whatever's agreeable which is everything they want one week from now so so that's that's what i'm saying under alternative relief my lady but otherwise we just need some protection going forward day on day thank you my lady you the directives that she is suggesting is if you are not with them, um, you do not need to interfere um, in the process. There is, there is no there is no justification to, to interfere. Well, um, the other aspects, um, the leadership, I, I think my learned friend basically is asking that her leadership could just issue an order maybe today or tomorrow. Uh, without reason. I, uh, that's our, that, that's yeah, no, I think he's just saying that while I'm reserving my judgment, that there won't be any kind of arrest. I'm assuming that's what he's asking. Well, the, the leadership, I don't have instructions in that regard. We well, if it's quick, I'm assuming that there won't be any. If the judgment comes quickly. 
Well, your book? Yes. Uh, your, le your, le your leadership, we. Can, if, if her leadership would uh, perhaps. Uh, no, I think I'm pushing it too far. I was going to say if her leadership could perhaps indicate when the judgment would be out and then we could give, we can hold on until then. Um, but I think I'll be pushing it too far if I. Uh, as a court business. As a court business.